Nestled along the coast of Portugal, the small town of Nazaré has become internationally famous for its colossal waves, some reaching a staggering 30 meters in height. But what exactly causes these massive waves to form? Will the answer lies in a complex set of ocean processes, particularly in the way waves interact with the seafloor's underwater topography? At Nazaré, the underwater canyon just offshore plays a pivotal role in shaping these waves. As the waves approach the coast, they encounter this canyon which funnels the energy of the waves, concentrating it and causing the waves to grow larger. This dynamic interaction between the waves and the varying seafloor depth is what gives Nazare its reputation for producing some of the most dramatic and powerful surf on the planet. Recreating these natural conditions on such a massive scale is a challenge in a laboratory setting. So, how do we do that? So, this is the problem if you want to recreate the actual Nazare wave. The Nazare has 30 meters of wave height, while the depth of the canyon is 5,000 meters, which means it has a 0.006 scaling. That's an issue. We cannot recreate that in the lab. What do we do? Okay, since replicating the beach wave found on Nazare is not possible, we are focusing on the effects of topography on long waves. The dispersion relation of surface gravity waves explain how the property of waves interact by angular frequency, Coriolis force, gravity, horizontal wave number, and depth. In this instance, we can neglect the effect of Coriolis because due to our scale, and just focus on this part. By applying the long wave limit into the relation that is shown like this, a horizontal wave number and the depth is less than 1, the dispersion relation of long wave can be written as such. From this, we will get the phase velocity and the groove velocity is the same. which will give us a non-dispersive wave. In this limit, its behavior is similar to shallow water waves. As the wave propagates to shallower water, a phenomenon known as wave shoaling occurs. This is when wave speed slows down and the wave height increases to compensate for energy conservation. Now, imagine when we have two conditions of the shallowing side by side. The one shallowing condition is steeper than the other. This should make the wave on the steeper side go slower than the wave on the other side. This should cause faster wave to bend towards the slower side. Theoretically, we should see a wave refraction. If the refracted wave encounter the unrefracted wave, this could potentially result in wave superposition that would amplify the wave height. Thus, we arrive at our research question. Can varying topography depth result in wave height amplification? Before conducting the laboratory experiments, we first need to run simulations to determine if they are feasible. So, the model that we are going to be using is PyOM2. It's an ocean model that is programmed with uh, Fortran and Python that resolves the Navier-Stokes equations. So, in the first scenario, we are simulating how long waves interact with a slope topography. In the first scenario, I simulate long waves interacting with a slope topography. The waves are generated at a frequency of 3.5 Hz in a tank with a water depth of 5 cm. Since the wave's wavelength, 20 cm, is shorter than the dimensions of the topography, the waves interact with it. This interaction reduces their wavelength and amplifies their amplitude towards the end of the slope. Now, let's move on the second simulation which includes the canyon. 
Up until the waves reach the topography, the setup remains the same as the first scenario. Key difference arises when the wave reaches the canyon. The left side of the wave flows through the canyon faster than the section traveling over the slope. This speed difference causes the wave to refract to the right when the canyon wave reaches the second plateau. When this refracted wave interacts with the wave from the slope, they overlap and amplify. The difference between the canyon simulation and our reference simulation confirms wave amplification is possible when the two waves converge. Designing the experiment for this study is relatively straightforward. However, it is crucial to determine the specific measurements and requirements in advance. Now that our simulations confirm wave amplification is possible, we can move to the laboratory and begin designing the experiment. First, we need a wave tank, a long and durable structure capable of containing the required water volume. The tank must also provide sufficient space for generating the desired waves, accommodating the scaled bathymetry we designed, and ensuring proper wave dampening to minimize unwanted reflections. Second, we require a wave maker capable of generating waves at the desired frequency and amplitude. This is essential for studying how waves interact with the design topography. Third, we need materials to absorb wave energy, which will minimize the effects of reflected waves on the incoming wave field. And lastly, we need the topography itself. For this experiment, the topography must be designed to transition seamlessly from a baseline reference to a canyon configuration without being removed from the tank. Next, we need to set some parameters for running the experiment. And in order to produce wavelength of 20 cm inside the tank, we would require a water depth of 5 cm with a frequency of 3.5 Hz. However, I would suggest for us to increase the water depth as we go on with the experiment with the corresponding frequency in order to prominently see the effects of wave amplification better. With everything sorted out, now we can continue to assemble and run the experiment. Let's analyze our findings. We successfully create long waves that propagate through the tank. In the case where we have only a slope, as soon as the wave reaches the slope, the shoaling effect is happening. The wave speed is slowing down and the wavelength is getting smaller. For the canyon setup, we place a steeper slope on one side and a gentler slope on another. The steeper slope produces a slower wave speed than the gentler slope which resulted in wave refraction. The result is similar if we place the slope on either side. As the two slopes affecting the oncoming wave differently, the waves tend to converge on the plateau after the steeper slope, interacting with each other, resulting in wave superposition. Here, we have identified three distinct profiles in the topography. To quantify our findings, we conducted point measurements along three separate lines each containing five different measurement points for wave height. These profiles are situated in an area where we observed wave amplification during our simulation. From the data, we noted that the wave begins to amplify starting from profile 2. This amplification continues to be noticeable at profile 3. However, within profile 3, we encounter an anomaly at the end of the profile where a measurement indicates a higher wave height compared to the other points. We suspect this anomaly is due to a high degree of uncertainty in our measuring tools. Overall, while we are unable to precisely quantify the amplification of wave height in this canyon scenario, our qualitative observation confirms the existence of the phenomenon theorized earlier. In conclusion, our study demonstrates that variations in topographic depth can induce wave convergence and amplify wave height. However, we were only able to qualitatively observe this wave amplification within the constraints of the experimental wave tank. 
to quantitatively assess this phenomena, further work is required. Enhancements to the experimental setup could include increasing the spatial scale by employing a larger tank or utilizing more precise measurement instruments, such as wave gauge. Nevertheless, our use of long waves successfully replicated the wave amplification phenomena observed off the coast of Nazareth. Thank you for watching.